Well, what a week it has been. And I see we're over on this mic, uh, this camera today. Hi, my name is Jeff Williams. You're here with North Star Oasis. Welcome aboard for another week's adventure. Uh, another week's adventure through history, another week's adventure through uh, modern current events. Uh, as we've been doing the last number of shows, uh, we kind of throw a hodgepodge of a little bit of everything uh, together for you. And just a reminder that there are 306 shopping days left until Christmas and I see that our young intern uh, Andrew over in the control booth he is smiling because he's already thinking about what wonderful things he's going to be getting under the Christmas tree. In the meantime our older producer he's also kind of nodding because he's envisioning what kind of new sophisticated computer and video equipment that Santa Claus will bring him but unfortunately they also have to wait 306 days. So again, uh, thank you for joining us for today's show. We're here at Suburban Community Channels, uh, also with uh, SPNN Channel 15 and other channels throughout the uh, Saint Paul, Greater St. Paul area. Uh, welcome. So as we've been having routine discussions in the last number of months, uh, probably since uh, we started the show back in November, We've had a tendency of discussing the railroads, and yes, I am a big train fanatic, as my producer will uh, let on, but the, the big thing that I, I keep coming back to on railroads is actually the pipeline, the, XL, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, we've discussed at length Warren Buffett's railroad, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. We've also discussed at length the uh, Canadian Pacific and their involvement with uh, rail uh, transportation of Bakken oil. The big thing that we have complained about on this show is how the environmentalist movement led by U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer insists that we cannot build the Keystone XL because, insert excuse here, Usually that excuse is that this is really harmful stuff, that this, a leak in the pipeline can really just be devastating without looking at how current Bakken and Canadian oil sands are being transported to the refineries now. I bring this up because on Monday, as we've been predicting right here on North Star Oasis, a catastrophe happened. This time was actually CSX Railroad, and this is uh, a rail a derailment from a 109 uh, car train. 107 of those 109 cars carried oil from the Bakken Reserve, and they were going through West Virginia. And I've heard some reports of 14, some of as many as 17 tanker cars exploded. So let's go to the video. This is what we had from Monday. The situation now is it looks like these rail cars will burn at least until midnight. About 1.20 this afternoon, uh, a CSX train carrying crude oil went off the track. And uh, we don't have an exact number of cars, but uh, they did catch on fire. And they set fire to Morris Bounds' house over there in deep water. He was able to uh, get out, running out, I guess, barefooted and escape without any serious injuries, although he's been taken to the hospital because he did breathe in some of those fumes. Um, it is a, uh, a still a huge cloud of smoke coming out of this thing. Uh, there have been evacuations in the Adena Village area and in Boomer Bottom, roughly a half a mile radius around where this fire is still burning. Uh, nobody's been hurt, fortunately, as far as we can determine. And uh, there's been an evacuation center set up at the Valley School Complex for these folks. Cedar Grove and Montgomery uh, closing their water intakes uh, on instructions from the state. Uh, and people being asked to conserve water in those areas. But uh, the fire very much still burning here. Uh, the general area around there, Route 61, is blocked off, not accessible to traffic. But uh, the roads here are not very accessible anyhow. Uh, heavy snow continues here. Uh, travel is difficult at, at any rate, and uh, that road is closed over there now because of the emergency. It's going to be some time before crews can get in. The DEP has been alerted and uh, may deal with the crew that's in the river. You don't see the river on fire every day. Hopefully a lot of the stuff will, in fact, be consumed by the flames rather than creating a water pollution issue. But uh, definitely a big fire out of this crude tanker derailment in Fayette County. Uh, anything further, Kenny? Oh, Bob, thank you very much. We'll uh, check back with you for more updates as you get. 
Water contamination issues. It's not every day you see the river or the water on fire. We wouldn't see the river or the water on fire if we actually had the Keystone XL pipeline passed. So for Senator Barbara Boxer, are you happy to see the rivers in Fayette County, West Virginia on fire? I sure don't like seeing that. And again, I'm a, I'm a rail fanatic. But what I don't like to see is that we have rivers that are on fire. We have people who almost lose their lives. We are very fortunate, very fortunate that no, this didn't happen in a major metropolitan area. Right now here in the Twin Cities, this, uh, Governor Dayton is discussing uh, the planned switcher in uh, the Crystal area that there's the CP and the BNSF rail tracks and they're trying to actually buy the land to make it available for trains to have an easy switch to, and bring all that oil right through Minneapolis. Of course, Governor Dayton, he's opposed to that. People in Crystal, New Hope, all that area, they're all opposed to it. But the thing is, they're also opposed to the Keystone XL pipeline. You build the pipeline, you'll have a better opportunity to have normalized rail traffic through the Minneapolis area and we don't have to worry about having explosions happen with the Mississippi River on fire. And that's why I keep bringing up rail issues with you simply because I don't want to see what happened in West Virginia, what happened in uh, Castle in North Dakota a year ago, or what happened in the Toronto area. I don't want that to happen here, and we are lucky so far with as many oil trains as pass through this state, we are lucky we have not had a catastrophe. But unfortunately, there will come a day when we're going to push our luck and we're going to push it too far, and that's what I don't want to see. So that's why I want to lead off with the West Virginia rail derailment story because it's important that it does not happen here. Uh, I'm not opposed to Warren Buffett making money on his railroad. I'm not opposed to the CP rail. I love the fact that they did the holiday train uh, last year in December and they do it every year. What I just don't want to see is people dying at the hands of not having the Keystone XL pipeline. So really want to see President Obama step up and sign the Keystone XL pipeline. Is he going to act on behalf of Minnesotans who want safety or is he going to be act, act on behalf of Warren Buffett? And it's up for President Obama to decide who he's going to side with. The people who got him elected or the people who just keep funneling money to his party. Because obviously with the Republican takeover of the um, U.S. House and U.S. Senate, Warren Buffett's money hasn't quite gone as far as Obama would have thought it would. We also have a billionaire in California that opposes the pipeline who actually now may run for Barbara Boxer's seat. What part don't these guys get? Pipeline equals safety. Keep that in mind. But I mentioned the CP rail system because last Saturday after we left this particular show, we went over to the Bandana Square and they have the Twin Cities Model Railroad uh, Association and, and Museum or the Model Railroad Club, their museum. And this year's main feature was the CP Holiday Train and that Holiday Train in miniature. And I'll tell you this, the Twin Cities uh, Model Railroad Club, and there's a Newport Ra Model Railroad Club, the model railroaders, they really do a wonderful job showing the detail of rail lines. I mean, they put great layouts out. They, they really know their stuff. And so there's two more weekends available. It's on, from Saturday from 6 to 9 p.m., so essentially an hour after the show. By the time you turn the TV set off after our show is over, don't touch that dial until after we're done. Uh, but then turn off the TV, get in your car, and go on down to Bandana Square. You've got tonight, you've got next Saturday. And that's it. They're done until uh, November. They do this night trains that goes from uh, November through February. Every year, 
but it's really worth taking the time to go and see. It is a beautiful show. And so what we're going to do right now is just give you a little bit of a preview. Um, this is their biggest fundraiser of the year. This is their biggest event of the season. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you a, a little bit of a video of the CP Holiday Train, both in December and what we shot last week that was put together by our producer, uh, Dallas Pearson. And then I just want to remind you again, go on out to Bandana Square and see this for yourself because it is amazing. Oasis exclusive because we are the only ones who will show you both trains this year. We'll show you the uh, Canadian Pacific holiday train as we just shown in that uh, segment and we also shown you the Twin Cities Model Railroad uh, Club's uh, miniature version of that same train. And next week we are actually going to uh, do a little bit more extensive set on the Twin City Model Railroad Club. Uh, we've got some really, uh, really great interviews and some additional footage, and we will be bringing that to you next week as well. 
So again, tonight after the show, go on over to Bandana Square in St. Paul of Energy Park Drive and support the Twin City Model Railroad Club. Show up for their night trains. You will not regret that. And then you get one opportunity next week. Now, because this has been a very long week, uh, it was a, a long week because after we left here, we went over to Bandana Square for that footage. And then I'm also in a ma uh, master's in business administration program and had a very comprehensive paper that I had to do. And in the middle of all of that came an important anniversary on Thursday. And that is the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Iwo Jima of World War II. Uh, the Afton Historical Society had uh, graciously uh, brought me in to give a um, presentation on, on, the, uh, on the battle. And as a result, you know, we've, excuse me, uh, our young intern, Andrew, is trying to get my attention. And yes, I did see his uh, call a little bit earlier. So now that we're on the right camera, let me uh, get right back to what I was saying here. And that is that the, they brought me in to discuss the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Iwo Jima. And we are going to give you excerpts of that. I mean, it was, it's a really important anniversary because this is the only time in the Second World War, especially the Pacific Theater, where the U.S. casualties exceeded the Japanese casualties. 70,000 Marines hit the beaches on the Febr 19th of February, 1945. So, uh, although I will have to say that not all of them went in on the same day. Uh, the 5th Marine Division, the 4th Marine Division, they both uh, made the beachhead. Uh, it was a couple of days, three or four days later when the 3rd Marine Division went in. Uh, I know that there's probably some Marines out there who are saying, no, that's not quite right. The 3rd Division didn't go in for a couple of days. Yes, I know. Uh, but 70,000 Marines went in. The 133rd Navy uh, Construction Battalion went in. Uh, they reconstructed the airfields and got it ready for a uh, U.S. staging base for overflights from Saipan and Tinian over to Tokyo and helped facilitate the end of the war. The Japanese did have a uh, radar installation in addition to the three airfields, and so it was an important strategic position. But 6,821 Marines lost their lives. 20,000 Japanese lost their lives. And even though the island was given back in 1968, the Japanese are still looking for their loved ones. They're still trying to repatriate the, the remains of those Japanese soldiers who died in battle. Marines have had a closure, but there were still 6,821 families who lost fathers, lost uncles, brothers, fathers. And so we still pause and reflect at this point in time that, you know, this happened 70 years ago. Now before I show you the first section, I do want to hold up uh, a book written by a friend of mine. It's called A Tomb Called Iwo Jima, written by Dan King. Look it up on Amazon. It's available. This is a fabulous book to look at, at the battle from the Japanese perspective. I mean, give a shout, shout out to Dan because he did a wonderful, he's an American, who did a wonderful job researching this, meeting up with a few Japanese survivors, and being able to tell the story from that perspective as well. So I'm going to show you a video right now on, um, that I had shown at the presentation the other night. And we're going to start off with a news newsreel footage from 1945 and then we're going to cut into a uh, musical overlay um, with uh, modern shots that another friend of mine had shot, uh, taken last year Iwo Jima eight square miles of volcanic rock to two divisions of the United States Marines fell the task of creating that bridgehead 4500 yards wide the greatest United States force ever assembled in the Pacific closes on Iwo Jima. 800 ships and thousands of small landing craft head for the island. Carriers, lying back of the main fleet, sent in hundreds of bombers. For 72 days before the landings, our bombers pounded the heavily fortified Jap base.
Suribachi, 546 feet volcano guards Iwo, and heavy, dangerous flak threatens planes coming in to dive bomb shore positions. The death-dealing planes of the task force return, some of them carrying the scars of battle. Others are even less fortunate. Breaking free of the wreckage, the pilot swims until help arrives. Our battleships struck ten separate times at Iwo to soften it up. The Japs, mistaking our reconnaissance for attack, reported our landings had been repulsed. Three days and nights of thunder and flame preceded the actual landing. The landings are routed with timetable precision. Marines of the 4th and 5th Divisions, delivered by the Coast Guard, head for the beach. Further protection is provided by a cover barrage of light guns and rockets. 40,000 Marines are rushed to the desolate shores of the island. So important is the plan for victory over Japan. Enemy planes based on Iwo's two airfields were a continual menace to our big B-29s passing near this base on the round trip to Tokyo. From rocky positions, enemy mortars shell our landing barges. And yes, Many boys died when a Jap shell made a direct hit. This happened 70 years ago this very week. Under murderous fire, the landings continue. The Japs spent a generation fortifying Iwo Jima, realizing its great strategic value. But the Marines never heard the word impossible. And this video and came out in 1945. they achieved the first successful military breach of Japan's historic boundaries. Casualties are heavy. 2,000 heroic Marines died on Iwo's bloody shores. Iwo's black volcanic sands make treacherous going. Through the slit of a tank, the camera catches the advance on Motoyama airfield, which will soon serve our bombers. The dogged attack rolls up the field, and shell fire destroys many enemy planes caught on the ground. Tank flamethrowers pour a withering blast at Jap pillboxes. This Jap never reached his foxhole alive. Transports, lying offshore, await the arrival of the few Jap prisoners taken. In nearly two weeks, only 85 surrendered. Half of them Korean slaves of the Japs. Digging foxholes in the loose black ash is almost impossible, and the barren island offers little comfort to a war-weary marine. Organized Jap resistance is over on Iwo Jima. This was the toughest single action of the Pacific War. It cost nearly 20,000 American casualties, over 4,000 of them dead. But 21,000 Japanese were killed or captured, and the American flag now flies on the summit of Suribachi. And that flag, keep it going. The flag flew 70 years ago, coming up on Monday.
gentleman right behind the rifleman is Chuck Lindbergh, who was from Richfield, Minnesota. He was the last of the flag raisers to pass away. Famous Joe Rosenthal photograph. This is from last year's reunion of honor. Some of these photos are courtesy of Christopher Marks. Third and fourth Marine Division Cemetery. Block house next to Turkey Knob. Seven years ago, yes, the United States won the battle. But if the Iwo Jima veterans of that battle can make peace, why can't we? Both sides fought and both sides really deserve to be recognized. The repatriation of American remains occurred in 1948-49. Families were given one opportunity to bring their loved ones home. Those who chose not to bring them home went to the uh, ones who did not choose to get, have, bring their loved ones home, uh, those remains were buried at the Punch Bowl Cemetery in Hawaii, where uh, many of them remain to this day. So seven years ago was a time of incredible sacrifice. For the Marine Corps, it was 36 days of hell, 36 days of being on the firing line, 36 days of rocketry, 36 days of small arms fire, and this was 36 days of 24-hour shifts takes a huge toll on the human psyche. I brought up uh, many times about post-traumatic stress disorder. These guys lived with it. The, for the survivors, these guys lived with it for every single day of the rest of their lives. There are still a few Iwo Jima veterans left. I've been very fortunate to have met a number of them. There are still a few who travel back to Iwo Jima. There, the uh, next Reunion of Honor tour will be occurring next month, a month from now. Uh, there will still be a few Marines who go back. They'll be meeting up with the families or some of their Japanese comrades in arms, the former foes who are now friends. So seven years ago was the end, the beginning of the end of World War II, but it was still came at an awesome price. And it's something that every American should remember. You know, I hear you know, the president talk about how much he wanted to bring, you know, bring all the troops home. Yes, getting off of a war footing is a really great thing. But at the same time, you still have to make sure that the mission is accomplished. In World War II, these guys knew that it was the total conquest of Germany and Japan. That is what would bring a long and lasting peace. Today, Japan is our ally. Today, you go to Iwo Jima and you got a U.S. Coast Guard uh, radar station or communication station. You have uh, an air wing from the uh, Naval Fifth Fleet. They've got a station there. The Japanese also have their maritime uh, defense installation there as well. And so Iwo Jima is still a military installation even today. But this time, the Japanese and Americans are allies. And, you know, it's, it's that part of, you know, being an ally that came out of all of this. You know, the pain of squandering the battle and the loss, it's much worse than some of the uh, battles are. Um, my producer's telling me something here, but he only gave me half of the, uh, half of the quote here. But anyhow, you know, he is right that there's a pain of squandering the battle. There is a huge loss, but, you know, the nice thing is the fact that U.S. and Japan, we get along today. Look at what's happening with ISIS. And with ISIS, you know, J Japan, they were impacted by ISIS. Jordan was impacted, and they came in, and they're bombing. 
But Japan, I don't know exactly what they have in mind, but they've been impacted too. Oh, and the, my producer says that he believes that Obama is threatening us with squandering the battle. And I, and, I, and I get his point, being that with as much sacrifices that we've made in the Iraq theater, and you know, we've made huge sacrifices in battle, that unilaterally withdrawing and leaving that vacuum is what Obama threatened us with, with squandering that battle. I, I understand what he's saying now. Um, but now going back to World War II, the fact is, we didn't squander that. Yes, there was an occupation with General MacArthur. But now, the United States and Japan are allies. And I sure hope we keep it that way. I think a lot of people hope we keep it that way. But that does not neglect the fact that 22,000 Japanese died at Iwo Jima, along with 6,821 Americans who died at Iwo Jima. That happened 70 years ago this week. Well, I'm going to give you a little clip from uh, the presentation that I had given on Thursday. And this is where I'm discussing Howard Smiley Johnson, who uh, played football with the Green Bay Packers and who lost his life at Iwo, along with Gunnery Sergeant John Bassalone, who received the Medal of Honor from his uh, actions at Guadalcanal in 1943, who also uh, lost his life on February 19, 1945. Um, I've kind of got two different sets of notes I'm going to be dependent on for a few minutes. There you go. Uh, tell you what, first of all, can you go back to the slide, previous slide in this? From the map. There we go. So right along here, we have landing beaches. Back up here, there were, well, the estimates vary. Um, Leonardo and I are actually trying to figure out exactly how many vessels were at Iwo Jima. He has identified 385 that were there. Estimates range as high as 800. It's part of the fifth amphibious corps. But we're not quite sure which vessels were and which ones weren't. So it's already been a year-long effort. And Leonardo's been working on that. And I'm referring to my friend him. Leonardo He's Flores yeoman's work in, from California. Uh, in getting me up to speed on the naval participation. And I will also mention that one of my artifacts here is from the uh, USS Libra, a.k.a. 12, amphibious cargo attack vessel. And we have uh, photos of crew members that was taken in April of 1945. These people were also there. And while we usually think in terms of the United States Marine Corps as being the major participants at Ewald, they were, but we cannot forget the Navy. The Navy also, without the Navy, the Marines wouldn't have gotten there. Without the Navy, the casualties wouldn't have been able to get back to hospitals. Or the bodies wouldn't have been able to be repatriated back to either the United States or the Punch Bowl Cemetery. So I have to give a great credit to the United States Navy as well, and think that they should also be remembered. But down here, the green beach is one and two. Each beach was about 550 yards, and so it started off from left to right, going from here all the way over to here. Up in this area, this is kind of like that vacant beach where they never really used it, but it's available in case we need to. Uh, so Green Beach, one, uh, Green Beach, uh, uh, there was just Green Beach. That was uh, 1st and 2nd Battalion, 28th Marine Regiment, 5th Marine Division. Red Beach 1, and we're just going left to right, even though they're not marked on here, just to give you a little bit of a visual. Uh, Red Beach 1, 2nd Battalion, 27th Marine Regiment, 5th Marine Division. Red Beach 2, 1st Battalion, 27th Marine Regiment, 5th Marine Division. Yellow Beach 1, 1st Battalion, 23rd Marine Regiment, 4th Marine Division. Yellow Beach 2, 2nd Battalion, 23rd Regiment, 4th Marine Division. And also on Yellow Beach 2 was the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Marines. They came in about 2.30 in the afternoon. The rest of them came in around 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, Blue Beach 1 was the 1st and 2nd uh, and Battalions of the 25th Marine Regiment, 4th Marine Division. And then Blue Beach 2 was that one where it was none if we needed to use it. 
So these were the landings. That, this right here is two miles. Two miles from here to here. It's not a lot of space. 70,000 people came in on those two miles stretch. <coughs> Next slide. And because I want to really get more into the stories of the people, I gave you a really nice long setup. But now I really want to get into the stories because it's the people who make the story remarkable. Now remember what I mentioned December 7, 1941. The Green Bay Packers were at Comiskey Park. Now I know when you mentioned December 7, 1941, everyone scratches their head saying, well, why are you going with the Marine Corps? All right, so what, why aren't you going to Pearl Harbor? Why are you talking about the, the Bears? I mean, come on. It's because of this guy right here. First Lieutenant Howard Smiley Johnson. He was at Comiskey Park as a member of the Green Bay Packers. He grew up in an orphanage in Clarksville, Tennessee, born in 1916. Smiley uh, was a heck of an athlete. He was given a scholarship to the University of Georgia. The lead attorney for Coca-Cola Bottling Works from Atlanta, Georgia, grew up in Clarksville. That's how they connected. It was that attorney who played on the 1901 Georgia football team who got smiling into the door. And he was good enough. He wasn't a brilliant student. Uh, I heard he was a C student. It was enough to get by. But he was a great football player. Not well known, but known well enough. He was getting there. Played on the freshman team in 1936. 1937, 38, 39, he played on the varsity team. He signed a free agent contract with the Green Bay Packers. The big uh, guard on the Packers team, this Curly Lambeau's era, was, um, and don't worry, the Vikings weren't even in existence then, so I'm uh, taking liberty to just speak freely. Um, but in 1940, he signed a free agent contract to replace Buckets Goldenberg. Goldenberg would later end up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Goldenberg was a hefty guard, really good at his job. Most of the Green Bay Packers players could not make it into the military at that time. Because most of them, were, it was a very experienced veteran team, kind of like the New England Patriots. They had bad knees, couldn't pass the physicals. But Smiley was a young guy. He played in 1940, he played in 41. He was a reserve. He was the guy in training to replace Goldenberg when Goldenberg retired. After Comiskey Park, third quarter of the football game, that's December when the 7, notification came out on Pearl Harbor being attacked. After that, he asked his wife, he wanted to do his part, he wanted to join the Army Air Corps. She said, no, um, get you killed. Airplane flying was still a relatively new thing. Smiley was on the very first flight of an NFL team to go from their home city to an away game in an aircraft. By that time, all it was train travel. It wasn't aircraft travel. The Green Bay Packers, 1940, were the first team to do that. I think Smiley got the thrill of flying. This is a guy who grew up dirt poor. You get the thrill of flying, it never could, it kind of leaves you. But if you're a married guy, you kind of know when the wife says, it goes. And so he joined the Marine Corps instead. He enlisted at first. He spent time out in uh, Pearl Harbor, working in supply. He got his commission. He was a college graduate. Went to Quantico, Virginia, for his advanced training. The commandant of that school at that time was Clifton Cates, who would later command him in the 4th Marine Division. Uh, there's a story that was told to me by uh, Dan Powers, who was actually a Hall of Fame tennis coach who knew Smiley at the University of Georgia. And that was in air. That's actually uh, Dan McGill. Powers was also a uh, Marine. I had him cross the These guys were at Quantico, and Tyrone Powers, well-known actor at that time, 
everybody knew Tyrone. If you were rich enough to be able to afford to dine to go on over to see a film. Smiley had never seen a film in his life. So Marie comes over and says, can you loan me a dime or a quarter to get the cab back to base? And Smiley says, sure, here you go. And his buddy is saying, you know who that is? No, it's another Marine. That was Tyrone Powers. Who's he? It's kind of like having Mel Gibson walk in here and say, hey, can I borrow five bucks from you? Everybody knows who Mel Gibson is. For sure. But Smiley didn't know. He made it through training. Then he went over to uh, Fourth Marine Division. The Fourth Division had spent their training time on Camp Maui, Maui, Hawaii. And these bottles, even though there's a label affixed, these bottles are actually excavated from Camp Maui. So we have a little bit of Camp Maui with us here today. The first 4th Marine Division action occurred at Kwajalein Atoll, as mentioned in the previous slide. I have uh, Marine Corps photographs, this is from you know, what they published at that time, of that invasion. Smiley was there. Uh, before they did that, we of course had Thanksgiving. I have a Thanksgiving menu postcard from Camp Pendleton, 1943. He led troops in battle. Made it through the Atoll. 1944, Smiley Johnson will receive the Silver Star at Saipan. I've met numerous Marines. I'm actually, as you can probably tell, I'm working on his biography. And every person that I've met who knew him said that this man right here, and this is actually his Silver Star uh, ceremony after Saipan. Every man, every person who I met who knew him looked up to him. People said that he was a Christian, he did not smoke, drink, or swear. He lived out his faith. He didn't need to preach it. I got guys who were in their 90s who are telling me that they have lived for 70 years because of the example that this man set. He commanded the Company I, the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Marines. They were the guys who came in at 2.30 in the afternoon. They hit the slopes, got the incoming fire. And sometime that afternoon, they went to the command post, got their orders to push in the attack. He went to get his platoon sergeants, meet with them, and as he met with them in the foxhole, an inbound mortar came in, killed all three of them. He's 28 years old. And to this day, people still hold him up as an example, even though he's been gone for 70 years. And the guy right here, very famous Marine, Gunnery Sergeant John Bassalone, C Company, 1st Battalion, 27th Marines, 5th Marine Division. They were trained out of Hilo, Hawaii. At the Battle of Guadalcanal in 1943, this man right here single-handedly took a, I believe it was a 50 caliber with his bare hands and just continued firing rounds to keep his people from being pinned down. He was the first Marine to receive the Medal of Honor for actions in World War II. He was pretty much doing something similar to that on Iwo Jima on the 19th of February. His unit was pinned down. If you remember that slide where I'd shown you the defense zones, and the one right next to Mount Sarabachi on the, on the bottom, he was in that area. He saw a tank pinned down. He went to rescue it. He found a pillbox. He went and single-handedly took out the Japanese pillbox. He shuttled ammunition back and forth. And he got hit with shrapnel and died like that. Another and he died just like that. 70 years ago. I'm going to show you one other video clip here today and this is coming from uh, Henry Tax and Nathan Smith. They were two Marines who served under Smiley Johnson. Uh, but before we show that I do want to mention that 
uh, one that this show along with the entire presentation uh, from Thursday night will be on our YouTube channel youtube.com slash North Star Oasis we are also on Twitter so follow us at North Star Oasis and we are also on you on uh, Facebook so make sure you go to facebook.com type in North Star Oasis and click like now, that way you can get access to our previous episodes and our current episodes and you're not going to be on the loop on anything so right now we're going to show you Henry Tax, uh, who had passed away a few months after this interview, he's the guy. He's going to be the guy on the right, and Nathan Smith, uh, the guy on the left. These guys were both at Iwo Jima with Smiley Johnson. They were both enlisted members of I Company Third Battalion, Twenty Third Marines of the Fourth Marine Division. And one of the most famous battles of the war. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I don't know, I don't know where your Higgins boat was, but when we were going round and round and round, and everybody was sick from the oil smell. Yep. We, we got waved off. We got waved off because the the beach was entirely, you couldn't see the beach. They they threw everything. So we we, we went single file around the New Yorker, the battleship New York. It was letting go 16-inch shells into Sorbachi. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, after the first one went, that Higgins boat went like that, uh, like it was going to just sink. <laughs> and, and the guys that had the demolition charges, you know, the caps, mm -hmm. they you off from concussion. First thing you know, the guys had thrown them all before. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have no demolition. <laughs> well, we went around the New Yorker. Man, no one, no one of my ears bad. You know. Yeah, mine too. Uh, and uh, then when you hit the beach and you see these uh, these navy ships loaded with holes in them, you know. Uh, I forgot what kind of craft it was, but it was uh, it was bigger than the Higgins boat and all that. But man, that guy hit the beach. He got there was nobody had a chance. Nobody. There must have been fifty holes this big in that uh, in the bridge and everything. And uh, and the Higgins boats, they were just all over, just floating around. You know. And Nance, you know where I have that little vial I have in there? Would you get that? When we hit that beach and we went up to the first plateau and we figured, you know, we saw that. We said, well, we'll dig in there, get a little shelter. That was like, that was the biggest mistake. You couldn't dig nothing. There's, there's the... Is that the sand of Evo? That's sand from Iwo Jima. That's the. That's exactly what it looked yeah. like. Volcanic ashes. Yeah. You, mixed with a little sand. When you dug a hole, it just filled right in again. It just filled. You couldn't. You couldn't build a, any no protection. That's what the beach looked like. Mm. Mount Suribachi left its mark when it blew up. It was volcanic ashes and sand mixed together. So what are your memories of the first day? The first night? Uh huh, the first night. I'll tell you what happened the first night. The first night, we were laying in that first wet hill and uh, we hear Lieutenant Gables the beach master, Marine. All right, air raid, air raid. <laughs> so we figured, oh, jeez, you know, I'm, they're going to bomb the beach, you know. So the guy comes over. Uh, oh, so we could hear the plane. We, one plane, we could hear it. And uh, Lieutenant Gables is saying, 
I want a uh, CB to move that tank, uh, that tractor, off that beach. Nobody moved. You didn't hear the tractor start there. <coughs> so Gable says, if I don't have a CB move that tractor, I'll have that whole battalion up for cowardice. No noise. Nobody, <laughs> nobody was dumb enough to listen to him. So, so the plane come over. He drops it in the water and on the airport. And man, when he dropped them on the airport, you went up that much. <laughs> I'll never forget Lieutenant Gable. I'll have the whole battalion up for cowardice. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then we made a big move. We moved about, we moved about fifty yards up to the next plant. Yeah. yeah, that was a big move. Yes, sir. So. Nathan, what do you remember about the first night? The first, first day and night? Uh-huh, mm -hmm. it will. Uh, I just remember that it was utter chaos to me. Oh, yeah. And we were so pinned down, we couldn't move, we couldn't, couldn't do anything. And they had let everybody get on the beaches, it seemed like, when they were really crowded. That's when they opened up. And, of course, we went in a little later, I think, than we Henry, but it was still, it was just utter chaos. And, and uh, why well, remember good move. that they had, and it was a miracle to me that it wasn't more killed because they had landmines all through. I, I, I don't know how Henry yeah. and I made it through right. all the land. A lot of people got their legs blown off, you know, by stepping on landmines right. and things. So the beach, they were ready for us. They had had a, over a year to prepare for us, and they said the the Japanese general was one of their top generals, and he... That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. He was the smartest Jap general in the Pacific. Yes, he was. And he, they weren't on Iwo Jima, and I've said this, they were in Iwo Jima. They were from 30 to 75 feet underground. He had interconnecting tunnels all under Iwo Jima, and all our pre-shelling and uh, bombings and from planes and everything didn't have any effect on them, it didn't seem like. He was ready for us when we got there. Henry Tax on the right, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. And then Nathan Smith was on the left. Uh, both of these gentlemen were with I Company, 3rd Battalion, 23rd Marines of the 4th Marine Division at Iwo Jima. You know, 70,000 Marines hit the beach, as we've mentioned earlier in the show. 6,821 came home in body bags. There were about 19,000 Marines who were injured. And I'm talking about the, the you know, gunshot wounds or other type of physical injuries. That doesn't include all of those who suffered with psychological in, uh, injuries that they lived with the rest of their lives. This is a generation that is fading fast. There aren't too many of them left anymore. Whole World War II generation. They're disappearing before our eyes. When I was a young child, I had an opportunity to meet the only World War I veteran left in town. And I thought that was really special. I was in kindergarten. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why I had such a wide interest in military history. It's because I met a World War I veteran. Growing up, World War II veterans, that was Grandpa. That was my friend's grandfather. We grew up with the World War II generation, but now as an adult, middle-aged adult, and as a combat veteran, I'll tell you, these guys are really, really special. So if you happen to have any World War II veterans who are either your friends or your family members, be sure to thank them because they've definitely earned that right. My father was a Vietnam veteran, and I thanked him for his service numerous times. 
And then, of course, I served in Iraq. Yes, I come from a long line of military veterans. Every generation of my family has paid a price. We've made sacrifices. But we're not the only ones. There are a lot of other families out there just like us who have a fine tradition of military service. And so I just want to take a moment to thank you for whatever branch you were in, whatever time period you were in, whether you are in combat or not. From the crew here at North Star Oasis, we want to give you our debt of thanks because you've earned it. So with that, um, we're getting to the end of our show. Never forget that we had a very, you know, important battle that occurred 70 years ago this week. Coming up in April will mark the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Okinawa. That was one step closer in putting the noose around the Japanese government's neck and facilitated an end of the war. So right now, for all Marines, I'm going to play the Marine Corps Band's the President's Own for the Marine Corps hymn. Corps hymn by the President's Own United States Marine Corps Band. So let's never forget what happened 70 years ago. 70 years ago, the ultimate sacrifice was paid by many people. And as I said on the very beginning of the show back in November, you know, why did they make that kind of sacrifice? Some of those issues are resurfacing now. But we're better off that they did. So for the crew here at North Star Oasis, Dallas Pearson, our producer, our young intern Andrew, and myself, Jeff Williams, thanks for watching. See you next week.